Rosa Amarilla, Rosa González. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the session on nature, new generations and circular economy. That's part of the Hay Festival Segovia 2020. I will start talking about nature. You know that all the matter, all the matter, all the things we touch, we drink, we eat, are made of tiny building blocks that are called atoms. There was a Russian chemist called Mendeleev who organized these atoms into what we know as the periodic table. Did you study that at, in school? Well, these atoms will be part of our pens, our iPads, our flesh, our nails, everything we do. And the thing is that they are in limited amounts in nature. Another fact, our planet Earth is what we see. Nothing comes in and nothing goes out except for the energy of the sun and occasionally a meteorite that breaks through the atmosphere. What we have now, we had 10,000 years ago, we'll have in 10,000 years from now. So we face the challenge of being prosperous and at the same time, taking care of what we have. And this is when the concept of circularity jumps in. I admire those that with hard work, lead the rest to think and to act in different ways. And this is why for me it's an honor to have here uh, with us today two remarkable humans. We have uh, Juan Lopez Duralde, uh, who's uh, sitting next to me. We have a hybrid model, <laughs> so that's why I'm looking for our other guest. Oh. Uh, we have uh, Juan Lopez Duralde, who's a former um, Greenpeace director in Spain. He's congressman of Unidos Podemos for Alaba, and he's also the chairman for the Commission of the Ecological Transition of the Spanish uh, Congress. And online here we have uh, Jocelyn uh, Bleriot, he's executive officer and head of international institutions and governments at Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So welcome here and thanks uh, for joining us in this hybrid model that uh, we're used to doing now at IE University, so it's um, great. Uh, so we will be talking mainly about uh, circular economy and I was thinking that it would be very uh, useful for all, us, all, all of us uh, if maybe Jocelyn could start giving us a little bit of background on, on what's happening uh, on circular economy and what are the, the steps and, and where's the future heading to. Please. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, great. Uh, it's a big question, Isabella. Uh, my sense is that there are many ways to express the, the circular economy. Uh, one that I'm particularly keen on at the moment is to look at the way that the circular economy is another model for value creation. So the inheritance and the legacy of the Industrial Revolution gave us a lot of efficiency when it came to extracting materials, turning them into products, and unfortunately discarding them as well. But in a context of scarce resource, more pressure on climate change, more pressure on pollution and damage on ecosystems, there is a real need to rethink those business models and those processes. And the, the circular economy rests on three fundamental principles. The first one is design pollution and waste out. So from the very start, upstream, look at products as things that should not have a negative impact when conceived, when made, and when used. The second one is to look at the importance of keeping those materials and products in the productive loops, in the economy, so keep the value, the embedded carbon, and, and all the work that has gone into those precious materials and components 
and keep the use of them to displace the need for additional virgin materials. And the, th the third one really is overarching. It's about the regeneration of ecosystem. The circular economy, in other words, is a system that builds value and capital, whether that's economic, social, or environmental, rather than deplete it. That would be my first answer. Now, if we want to have a look at what the status of the circular economy is globally, then maybe uh, it's a longer conversation at this point. Uh, I don't want to launch into a, a long lecture, so I'll take you a steer on when we want to address this specifically, but I'm happy to talk about it now. Great, yes. Well, uh, basically, I, I think that mainly one of the questions that I guess it's in the head of everyone is who's responsible for this, no? Who should be heading the transition? We have the governments, we have the private sector, the society, we could think of NGOs and so on. Um, taking advantage that we have Juan here, uh, maybe you can talk to us a little bit of how is it that governments are, are, are governing and, and putting policies and regulations in place and uh, where is this taking us, please? <laughs> well, thank you. Buenas tardes. <laughs> I'll try to, to speak in English, although it's a bit strange for me to speak in English here, but I'll do my best. Um, yesterday, when we were, we are at the moment in the, in the Spanish parliament discussing the law against climate change, which is something which hopefully will be approved in the, in the next weeks or months. And uh, yesterday, in one of the discussions we were having, someone was asking um, why, if the scientific community had already 30, 40 years ago uh, a big consensus that uh, climate change should be addressed and should be stopped, why that is not happening? And this, this is... Uh, a very interesting question linked to, to exactly what you were asking. Where does the responsibility lie? Because uh, if we take climate change, the scientific community is, is uh, raising the alarm already decades ago. Um, and someone was saying um, it has all to do with the economy or it is the economy which is not, which is not uh, addressing the problem. Governments fear uh, the economical powers, and they only move, most of them, to the point in which, in which they are allowed to move. And this is, a, this is the problem, because uh, so far we, we are on an economy based on burn, burning, um, burning uh, fossil fuels. And it is very difficult to change that. And this is what makes climate change such a difficult issue to address, because the, the big, the big uh, stakeholders, I would say, are governments and companies. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, of um, talk when, when we talk about climate change about individual responsibility, which is true as well. But if governments don't act, if governments don't put uh, regulations in place that make industries move, nothing will happen. And this is what so far has happened up until now, is that we have spoken and talked a lot about individual responsibility and not that much about what governments should do and why they are not doing it. And I really think we need to, we need to address that because we are already in a point in which the, the, the red line or the non-turning back point is, is very near. The scientific community is telling us that we have 10 years, to, 10 years to change. So we need that those who have a bigger responsibility, and this is, I insist, governments and companies, move forward. And I think it's starting to happen. Uh, yesterday we had what I think it's a very important step forward from the President of the European Commission from uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who, who announced that the EC is moving towards 
a reduction, a very substantial reduction of emissions of 55% in the year 2030. So I think that uh, things are starting to move, which is a little bit of hope uh, after years of, I would say, of, of lack of action. Yes, uh, what you're saying, I was thinking of the interconnectedness of the system, which um, really, like when, with the COVID on December, January, it was in China. It wasn't here, and suddenly things come. Climate change is something that maybe we see far, far away, and it's already here, you know? Um, and, and also about the, the, the companies, uh, it's kind of the same. This doesn't affect me because I need my model to keep on running and I have to change. And I saw an interview uh, that Jocelyn, you made to Franz Zimmerman, which was really interesting about the new policies from the European Union that were um, going to uh, be in place. And uh, I don't know if you want to talk. Uh, I don't know if we lost connection. Ah, here he is. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if you want to jump and talk about that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Uh, I think some some great points were just made actually, and and I totally subscribe to that. The idea that uh, the old model was essentially a race to the lowest common denominator with business trying to maximize profit on one side and policymakers trying to curb the excesses on the other side was always going to be a race to the bottom. Now there's a new perspective with the circular economy model, something that both sides of the equation can agree on. And actually it would be good to also pay tribute to Yanis Potoshnik who, uh, when he was commissioner for the environment uh, in 2012, put together the European Resource Efficiency Platform. And, and the great thing about this was that he invited all parties at the table. He had the Commission, the Parliament, member states, civil society, most importantly, business as well. And agreeing on that new way forward meant that we moved from uh, something which was defensive to a co-creation process. So to, to your question specifically, who has the responsibility? Everybody does. But I totally agree that the focus has been for a long time on the individual and their choices and consumer choices, which frankly, it, yes, of course, there is an individual responsibility. But if the citizen is at the heart of a system, he cannot play the cards that he hasn't been dealt. In other words, he plays the conditions of the system that he's in because it's a systemic issue and changing one, let's say, purchase habit or switching from one product to the next, of course, if you add all this up, it's going to make a bit of a difference. But if the fundamentals are wrong, if the cost incentive is wrong, if we keep uh, looking at a system which is linear and therefore incentivizes volumes without necessarily looking at the, the pricing of the externalities and the negative impacts of the economy on ecosystems, then it's not going to go very far. And we potentially run the risk at the moment of thinking because circular economy is uh, very much at the forefront and on center of the stage, that we have a choice between going linear and circular. Actually, circularity uh, needs to be created. The, the system has been hardwired for and by linearity and efficiency for good reasons. It has worked at some point. It has lifted billions out of poverty but it's, it's not the right moment anymore. We need to transition. So the underlying structure of the economy needs to be revised as well. And that's not gonna happen unless there is a very strong public-private dialogue. We see a lot of uh, investment going into a circular economy and we've seen the amazing performance of funds that uh, are geared towards environmental and social governance. They've outperformed anything else for the past six months. We have a, just released a finance paper and we, we see the rise of the financial uh, importance and the financial community investing in those strategies, which is absolutely colossal. And, uh, and as, uh, as you were saying earlier, the question is the policymakers feel they have a mandate when they know that business is going to be on their side. And of course, this is a very strong signal. If they're investing in that, then policymakers feel free to regulate in that direction, which in turns 
gives a, a visibility for the investors and confidence that actually regulation is going to go their way. So it's a mutually reinforcing loop and Franz Timmermans, Ursula von der Leyen are very great champions of this and uh, the, the COVID recovery and the importance of circular economy and the Green Deal within that is firmly established, I think. We can't be naive, it's going to be a, a long process and there will be uh, several hurdles along the way. But uh, I would share the, the hint of optimism that has been expressed and, and say the building blocks are in place. We need to make sure that we put them in motion and have the right dynamic. Yes, um, you were talking about the recovery after COVID. And I have read that, uh, and I would like to know your opinion, that uh, certain uh, packages, as you know, the, the economy, the GDP is dropping in many countries. So there are extraordinary measures now in place and stimulus packages from different uh, governments. Are we letting aside uh, the sustainability agenda, the circular economy? Because it's a, a social emergency with many layoffs with this economic crisis. What do you think about this? Well, there's a risk that that happens because what we see is that when when the uh, the first months of the of the crisis of the COVID crisis, um, many things happen and, and and many of us thought maybe the lessons we are learning will be applied for a change. Uh, for example for the first time the levels of pollution in cities like Madrid were, were getting really low because we were all in our houses, we, we were not allowed to move. So uh, for the first time in a life, I would say, many of us uh, saw Madrid without pollution, which is, which is, which is radical. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's terrible to say it, but, but it is the first time we, we, we have seen it. Or uh, we saw how wildlife recovered in, in certain places, emissions dropped, and there was a kind of, of uh, hope, things are going to change. Unfortunately, this hasn't happened. Unfortunately, uh, we are going back to where we started, and uh, for example, the global emission levels uh, of CO2 are, are rising again, so it seems that we haven't learned any lesson from, the, from this from this crisis, mm, and not only that, but uh, there is, there is, like I would say, there are two forces or two ways of thinking on how how should we move forward from here. Uh, some of us think that the that the way forward is is really looking into changing the system, and this 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 means moving into circular economy, moving into green economy, into into really. Uh, a new way of, of uh, industrializing, a new way of producing energy, of producing crops, of producing food. Um, and this is what we hope can happen. And this is uh, one, there's one force going in that direction. But there's one force, uh, at least in Spain as well, going in the, let's say, traditional direction, which is let's go back to the um, to the usual or the traditional economic sectors. Let's go back to building, let's go back to, to construction, let's go back to cars, let's, go, let's get back uh, our cities full of cars and so on. So these, these two forces are somehow fighting, not in a direct fight, but as two ways of understanding how we should move forward. My hope is that, is that we really move into a new direction. I think that's uh, as we were saying, that's as well where the European Union uh, wants to move because there's a vision that the future should go in that direction. But uh, it is true that the forces that don't want to move, that, that, want, uh, that think that the way out of this is like, like following the process that, that brought us here, uh, are strong as well. So, so uh, this is... This, this uh, dynamic of, of uh, two ways of, of, of uh, thinking is, is very clearly on the society and it's very clearly on the political agenda. I was talking before uh, how we are discussing the, uh, the climate change law in the parliament at the moment, and you could see these two, these two ways of, 
of thinking in the in the political debate as well. So let's hope that that we learn and that we understand that uh, there is no future because it is important for everyone to know that uh, the COVID the COVID crisis is just a small crisis compared to what climate change will bring us and to what the destruction of the earth, of the environment, will bring to humankind. And I think we, we need to understand this. And I think that, that uh, sometimes we look very closely to the problem we have in front of us, which is the actual uh, health crisis, and, and, and we are blind to seeing forward, to looking forward. Yeah, well, actually what you were, um, just said about uh, part of me and part of each of us, we want to go back to normal because we see that uh, the economies, uh, they're having a hard time and this eventually translates to people losing their jobs and uh, I'm afraid to think that maybe the only way moving forward is that we really need to collapse and then restart. I believe there has to be another way to do things. Uh, but but uh, I do agree that, that I feel myself like, well, we have to reactivate the economy, go back to, but, but that wasn't the right answer either. Uh, so here we have a, a dilemma and we really need to protect the people. And um, I think that maybe uh, the social part of the agenda uh, needs to, I don't know about it, if, Maybe any of you can talk uh, of how to protect the jobs, how to reskill the people. What is it that we need to do? Very briefly, from my side, uh, there is no there is no social side without environmental side. If we if we are not able to to save the people and save the environment at the same time, then we will lose both. So I think both should go hand in hand, and I think that the and not that I think, but but many many reports. Uh, proof that the, where most of uh, new jobs uh, opportunities lie is on the on the green sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jocelyn, I, um, we cannot see you. I don't know if you want to add anything to the. Uh, social. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I totally subscribe to this again. Uh, the fact is that COVID, uh, yes, in the grand scheme of things, it's a minor crisis. Having said that. Uh, it is a human tragedy, both on the health front, uh, for the people who lost their loved ones, but also for the people who are suffering economically as a result. Uh, it is also a, a, a transition for many sectors who were already starting to feel the, the crunch because they rely heavily on either fossil fuels or very polluting activities. We see that mobility has been super hit, the, the construction sector has been badly hit, Aviation is going to be badly hit, and, and yes, there is a potentially a temptation to go back to business as usual and to turbocharge it in order to minimize the pain, but also there's realism on the fact that the transition and the call for a system reset was existing because, before the pandemic, and it's made even more relevant. So the jobs aspect is important. What sort of jobs? where, how, the quality of those jobs. And if we take a very specific example, so n not to remain too academic, the renovation wave, which is called by the European Commission as a priority. So looking at the building stock, the houses and the offices in Europe, which really need to be retrofitted to be uh, compatible with the climate agenda, because we know that the, a lot of the energy uh, consumption comes from buildings, the making and the use of those buildings, while saying you're going to retrofit this, you can do it two ways. You can do it in the normal way, or you can go towards more circular materials. You can go for business models that lease solar panels that then feed the grid and then recuperate some of the money from that side. Uh, look at buildings as material banks. And by definition, these jobs are local because you don't send the building to be retrofitted somewhere else. So looking at all of this uh, economic challenge through the lens of how can we at the same time alleviate the pain and future-proof it, I, I think that's, that's the most interesting thing. And the pandemic has revealed the brittleness of certain supply chains, certainly when it comes to availability of spare parts, not only for the medical sector, 
I was also talking to farmers who said that they had had a hard time finding replacement parts during the pandemic due to border closures and, and all commerce stopping. And, and that is crucially important. That also says that we need to have local hubs, remanufacturing, we need to have more local food production and that seen. I mean, the uptake of local food and, and of course, because it's a health issue, people were very much more uh, desire, they, they wanted more uh, traceability regarding what they ate and, and traceability by definition, if it's closer to you, you feel more comfortable with it. So all of that dynamic of relocalizing as well, not to say everything has to shut down, there will be international trade, of course. But if we look at solving with the mindset of solving and changing at the same time, then it's already a really good step. And I think the, the commitments made by the European Union to look at these Green Deal and circular economy as the way forward to generate the next wave of prosperity and, and underlying this with really strong values when it comes to social and environmental governance is really key and needs to be supported. So again, we can't be naive, it's not going to be very easy, but all the efforts we can make in order to bring the right data, bring the right people to the table and make sure this is a very enticing, inspiring proposition. That's what can be done at the moment. It is an important moment and everybody has to seize it. Yes, um, I, I was also thinking about the role, um, for me a very important role, of NGOs and um, supranational organizations, uh, mainly in generating awareness and also putting pressure uh, to governments, to companies, so that they start acting uh, in different ways. And I will put an example here. Uh, and this is how some years ago, uh, for example, it was allowed the dumping of certain types of waste in Spain, but it, they weren't allowed in Germany. So well, in Germany, they just brought their waste to Spain and they dumped it here. So having structures that go over the governments and uh, even higher, this uh, allows for a regulation and control so that these things uh, don't happen. Uh, do you have more examples or do you want to share information on this? Well, I have a lot of examples because, yeah. <laughs> I, because I was for many years uh, a member of Greenpeace and uh, the reason I joined Greenpeace in the 80s was because uh, the Spanish government granted a permission to a company to burn toxic waste out in the ocean. There were special vessels that uh, came into port, take the waste and burn, burn them out in the oceans. Of course, this was a very, a very pollutant activity and uh, Greenpeace was trying to stop it. And in fact, after a series of actions and political work and so on, uh, there was an international ban on, on uh, ocean incineration, it was called ocean incineration of toxic waste. And I was very young, but I thought, wow, this is powerful. I mean, uh, it, it is really, uh, for me, it was, a, it, it was a very important experience as a very uh, young activist to see that you can change things uh, via um, that activism. So that's, that's still on. I'm, I'm now, uh, of course, doing different things, but I still think that the role of civil society is extremely important. I see it now, let's say, from the other side of the of the barrier, because now I am in the, in the parliament, mm. and uh, I, I receive, now I am, let's say, a victim, not a victim, but a receiver of, of their pressure. And uh, it is very important, because uh, we must not forget that uh, the industry, companies, they're always there. Uh, they are not so loud, maybe they, are, they don't appear in the newspapers, but they do lobby a lot. Mm -hmm. They do lobby all the time. They are, they are uh, in the parliament, they, they are calling you, they are asking for meetings and so on. So it is very important that there is a counter power. For example, uh, last week, a number of, of NGOs announced that they have taken 
action and taking the Spanish government to court. And I am part of the Spanish government, <laughs> but I think that they did the right thing because, because, uh, because we need someone to say, you are not doing enough to remind us that. So um, I think that is extremely important. For example, uh, I believe that one of the best things that has happened to the environment and to the environmental struggle in the last uh, years has been the emerging of the, of the youth uh, movement, of, of the young people, the young generations, saying, hey, stop destroying our planet. We, we want to continue living here. This, this movement has, has, bring, has brought uh, a, a lot of strength to the, to the demand of, of a cleaner world, and I think that has been extremely positive, and I hope that this doesn't stop with the, with the COVID thing, and, and it continues with the, same, with the same strength, because it is really important, and when you are in the parliament, when you are inside the building, you can feel the people shouting outside. It is important. It is really influential. Yes, and also um, many times, and it's good to wear different hats throughout your career, no, because you get to to know how uh, each uh, person feels and, and their role. No? Uh, coming back to nature, and many times um, our, our acts are short-sighted, short and with this I mean that we're not aware that nature and the planet is a whole and it can come back to us somehow. Um, an example, and, and, and I guess this is what eventually will make us start acting differently. I was thinking of the example of the Amazon um, forest, which actually is, uh, we're reading a lot about it lately. <laughs> There's some controversies, political and nature, environmental. And the thing is with coffee, I'm sure many of you drunk, uh, drink coffee every day. Well, the thing is that uh, because of the Amazonas and, well, many regions, deforestation, uh, there's a, a fungus that's uh, attacking the crops and it's due to the humidity and the higher exposure to sunlight instead of the, um, the, the shades of the trees and so on. And, and this is having an effect, so you think that the Amazonas that was being destroyed had nothing to do with you, and now suddenly it does, because then the coffee industries, they are in the uh, countries where you live, you drink coffee in the morning, and I mean, everything comes back to you. And, and that's where I think also we need to go back to the companies, they are starting to um, feel the risk is real and it's and and, and they we need to to change the model actually there's a, a data from uh, actually ellen macarthur foundation that um i think it's the funds the financial funds that are investing in sustainable companies and companies with a circular economic model have multiplied by uh, 10 in the last five years uh, Jocelyn, would you like to give us some more information about this and comment, please? It's, I always look yeah. around. <laughs> yeah, go well, on. I think, as I was saying earlier, the, the report is very recent and, and it shows a dramatic rise in the, uh, in the level of interest of the financial sector for these, what they call ESG, environmental social governance activities. And they are calling for criteria. So investors have decision-making mechanisms that rely on specific criteria. And whether you take into account, for instance, your um, environmental impact as a company, your diversity, etc., they're starting to be a way more stringent than they used to. And, and there are a lot of investment funds that now are asking companies to disclose their climate exposure. So the risk that they face due to climate change uh, being uh, such a, such an acute problem at the moment because it's become absolutely clear to everyone involved that the survival of society and within that the economy of course is dependent on the uh, the ecosystems that we rely on so a company will not be able to operate when there's nothing left of course and so the 
there are two ways of looking at this. You're exposed if your activities depend heavily on the ecosystems and you're exposed doubly if you're dependent on these and everybody is to a certain extent. And on top of it, your current activities help contribute to the acceleration of that degradation. So we clearly see a movement and the fact that the uh, companies that have moved from saying we're making a commitment on climate, we're making a commitment on specific packaging, now that translates not only at, at brand level and that goes way beyond one company making a pledge to actually people feeding those companies with the financial capital that they need saying before you get access to that funding, you need to demonstrate that you're taking this seriously. So as you were saying earlier, everything's interconnected. And I think maybe in a not so distant past, some people could still look at the Amazon burning and say, this has nothing to do with me. But when you have this, the fire is in California. You have Siberia, Siberia is burning. And all of these catastrophes, you know, you have the floods, etc. It's becoming a bit big, right? To just say nothing to do with me. So there is a massive emergency for sure. Uh, there are signs that uh, the level of awareness about the interconnectedness of all these activities is, is growing. And when we see the, the shift in the level of capital that is allocated from let's say, look at coal, look at coal recently over the five years. I mean, it's a dramatic thing. And, and most of the uh, private operators are openly now saying this is an industry that doesn't have a future at all. So they're not even bothering to defend it anymore. It's, a, it's a, quite a momentous a period that we're living in. Yes, but for example, the coal, and, and I know uh, in Spain we do have a certain um, related issues, maybe not so much with coal, but with other industries which we know are kind of damaging the environment, but the transition has to be slower. And how does that happen? Because you need to orchestrate so that all these people can be useful in other industries and, and their works and so on. Yeah, but for me, the point is not that the transition has to be slower. I think that the point is that the transition needs to be fair. It means that, this means that um, governments should allocate resources to ensure that there is a future for those communities uh, and for those workers who, who, which are victims of, of the change, like, for example, the coal workers. And this is happening. This is happening. I mean, uh, there, is a, there is a willingness, and there is, a, at least in Spain, and there is a, a commitment to ensure that, that these, these uh, needs are covered and that even companies are committed to relocate those workers in, in other areas of the, of the activity uh, of the company. So this, of course, is, is, is very important. We need to ensure that, uh, that the, it is done in a fair way and that no one is left aside. I think that is very important to ensure as well that uh, transition happen because we have, uh, on the other side, we have the example of the uh, yellow jackets in, in France, you know, people who was uh, protesting and the protest started because they were uh, opposing the increase of, of, uh, of the price of diesel, you know. So if you, if you don't ensure that, uh, that the transition is fair, it may backlash on you and we cannot afford this. So this is, this is a very important point. But going back to what uh, Jocelyn was saying, I think that this, this reality that everything is interconnected uh, needs to be uh, in, in everyone's mind, especially on the policy makers. For example, when, when we are discussing in the parliament in Spain, some people say, why should Spain um, legislate against climate change if, if we only are responsible of 0.7% of the global emissions? And we say, well, if each country if each community says, well, I'm only responsible of 1%, I'm only 2%, so nobody would do anything. And we need to understand that, that this, is, this is a global issue. We have all our share of responsibility, and we need to act, all of us. Yeah, especially 0.7% uh, we are responsible for, and I'm sure we have more than the 
less, I mean, of the population worldwide. But there's, but there's other, other issues. I mean, the point here is if, if we don't act, it's not only that, that we will uh, not be uh, on the front line on, on environmental struggle, but that we will lose the train of a new industrialization, we will lose the train of, of changing, the, 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 the train of power, uh, the, the, the train of, of investigation, development, you know. It is, the world is changing, technologies are changing, um, the way we produce energy is changing, and if we keep uh, on our side without any change because we don't want to do anything because it's not our problem, then we are losing that train. So it is a question of, of, of leading if, 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 uh, and, and I think that the, when we were talking about uh, von der Leyen, I think that the willingness of the European Union is to lead, because the European Union is not the main emitter. We have China, we have the US, but I think the European Union has understood that this way we may lead, we may create uh, new ways of producing energy, new ways of a new, new, a new industrialization, a clean industrialization. And the ones who take the flag and the ones who lead is going to lead in the future as well. And I think the European Union is starting to understand it. I, th I think that's good. Yeah, yeah. and totally. I, I couldn't agree more. It's a competitiveness and innovation agenda. And yes, the European Union is not the biggest emitter, but it's also the biggest market on the planet which means that the prescriptive power that it has, for instance, enforcing hypothetical circular economy product standards or looking at minimum requirements for anything that gets put on the market, well, that is huge because it is the biggest market on the planet. And I totally subscribe to the idea that it is a competitiveness innovation agenda. This is the economy of the future that we're talking about. And nobody wants to take the train too late or miss the train. I think it's clear that uh, a lot of European member states have understood that. They're supporting the European Commission. They're going sometimes above and beyond recommendations of the Circular Economy Action Plan. And the idea really is, this is a positive. You know, we, we need also to stop framing things in terms of we're averting catastrophe. Actually, we're proactively building the future. Yeah? And that, that is really uh, motivating. Yes, of course, there are really painful challenges that result from the old model. But if you resist and if you delay that transition, that boat will have sailed by the time you do wake up. And I think this is also why the, the financial sector is waking up to this, because these guys like to see ahead of the curve, because if you miss out, it's too late. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so about proactively changing, uh, I have a sense that maybe during some years the legislators have gone like putting patches on reputational issues and this came to my head because of the yellow jackets and certain substances were banned suddenly and a substitute came in and it's much better than the other and it wasn't analyzed and maybe it was even worse because we couldn't use it afterwards for a new process. Do you think that we, we now understand how the things are working and the consequences of these type of behaviors and we're heading in the right direction? <laughs> I think, I think the, the, the story is, is not linear. Uh, I think that uh, until the, let's say, the 90s of the, of the past century, uh, governments were taking specific action on specific things. And uh, some good things were done. For example, now nobody speaks about the ocean layer hole because action was taken in the 80s to ban uh, CFCs, which were the substances which uh, produced that damage to the ocean layer. So the, the governments did act on the scientific basis. What's the problem? The problem is that addressing climate change goes to the heart of our society. It is, not about, it is not about banning one specific substance. It is about changing the way we produce energy. And energy is, the, is, is what, what builds a society. Our society 
uh, is, is, is built around uh, fossil fuels since the uh, 19th century, and changing that is difficult. And this is why uh, addressing climate change is, is uh, much more difficult than addressing other problems that were addressed. And this is why I think that the whole thing came into a, a crisis, because uh, environmental, environmental regulations on specific things have proven uh, some, uh, some movement forward, but have not been able to change the big picture. And this is what we have to change. Yes. So we only have five minutes um, left. As a wrap-up, would you both like to uh, say when do you think this is going to happen, the change? Uh, how close are we? Uh, how far away? Uh, what's your feeling? Uh, I don't know if uh, you want to start. If, yeah. if, if you want me to start, yes. uh, I think that the change has started and uh, there's a struggle of time. If the question is whether we will be will be quick enough to make that change. The scientific community has told us that we need to, to be effective in that change in this decade, mm -hmm. and uh, this is why we need to hurry up. So I am optimistic. I think the change has started, and hopefully we will be able to, we will be able to not stop the whole thing, because it's important, but to somehow uh, get into a better situation, hopefully. But we need to, to be strong and, and committed. Yeah. I'm optimistic as well. But you're asking for a date. And unfortunately, I broke my crystal ball last week, and I couldn't replace it. So I, I won't be able to give you a date. But recent history, which is not linear, effectively, does tell us that things tend to happen quicker than expected. Look at the mobility transition, the EV, look at the renewables and the price of solar power dropping by 70% over the last five years, for instance. All of these things seem to consistently happen faster than we anticipated, which is a signal that A, change is possible, that when we put your minds to it and you make a really good economic case for it, then of course it's an incentive for all actors to move and yes, let's stay super mobilized because this is liberating when it comes to creativity. Uh, this is liberating when it comes to competitiveness. We will be uh, rushing towards a carbon-free, more livable economy. And hopefully the, the prosperity of the 21st century will be radically different and bring along another X billion of people and rising the, that, the, the boats of the ones who desperately need and deserve to have access to a level of material comfort that we enjoy. All of this with the help of digital technology and technologies and processes that are regenerative and that actually work hand in hand with ecosystems health as opposed to destroying them. Yes, I, I also want to add uh, to this, uh, which I, I, we haven't uh, talked about this, but I also think that the power of education and, and having people, the children, and all the way throughout their careers trained adequately to foster a sustainable mindset, that's also uh, a task that we have to pursue and that will help us in this transition, I guess. So, well, thank you very much uh, for being here today. And it's been a wonderful conversation. I enjoyed it a lot, so I hope you all did. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.